All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan, and today is election day here in the U.S., a big midterm election. I do hope you voted if you live in this country, and maybe the episodes we've done over the last couple weeks have given you some context for how midterms play out, or at least something to think about. And today's episode, it's a bit of a special episode, is something to listen to as you stand in line to vote, or maybe as you're doing some last minute campaign work, or awaiting the results which can take a while. And that is kind of what this whole episode is about. This is a conversation we originally did for Election Day two years ago in 2020, a brief history of all the ways in which we convey election results. Because this is the whole tree falling in the woods thing, but does an election really exist if no one is there to announce the results? Think about it, folks. Think about it. Anyway, this is a very fun conversation and, of course, something that is very much in the air right now. How do we count votes? How do we talk about the results? How long does it take to get the results? It's going to be a bit, I think, for a real picture to emerge in this year's election. And a lot of the conversation that you're about to hear is about that tension between speed, the push for instantaneous information, and maybe that not being the healthiest thing for our democracy. Anyway. Our guest for this episode is Jad Abumrad, former host of Radio Lab. Actually, listening back to this episode in 2020, I introduced Nicole Hemmer as professor at Columbia and Jad as the host of Radio Lab. And of course, Nikki has now left Columbia. Jad has left Radio Lab, and they're actually both at Vanderbilt University. So there you go. Some changes since 2020. And yeah, if you're listening to this and you think, huh, that comment seems a little out of date. That's why this is a rerun from two years ago, but still very interesting, worth listening to. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it occupies a little bit of your election day or day after election day and happy voting, everyone. All right, here we go. Let's start actually then. We're going to go sequentially through the years. We have about five moments um, over the last hundred 50, 120 years or so. But let's start in actually 1904, um, because something really interesting happens in 1904, and it provides the origin for a phrase that I have used many times, but never actually stopped to think about. Uh, the phrase is the news flash. So, Nikki, tell us in 1904, what is a news flash? Well, it comes down to what's happening over at the New York Times down in Times Square. They decide that they're going to communicate the presidential election results through this giant searchlight that's on the top of the Times headquarters. And so the idea is that if they flash the light to the east, then the Democrat Alton Parker will have won the election. And if they flash it to the West, then Teddy Roosevelt will have won re-election. If it's to the North and South, you get the answer for the governor's race. So this was their way to kind of be the first to call the race in the city. Wait, you mean the flash was actually a visual flash of light? Yeah, like a searchlight flashing the results in sort of a, a code that was disseminated in advance. Oh, that's so cool. And it wasn't Morse code. It wasn't like Morse code. It was at any given point you could look up at the light and if you knew, you know, decipher it. I mean, the the Empire State Building sort of still does this, right? It has those lights at the top and every once in a while there'll be some symbology to that. But yeah, I mean, I I love this as just a way that an entire community can kind of look at something together and, and, and gain some basic information. But I also love or I note that, you know, this comes from, as you said, Nikki, 
a real push to be first, right? Um, and to and to um, show off that you're first in probably the most public way possible, which is like streaming lights over the over Manhattan. Yeah, and in a pre-broadcast era, this is how you have to do it, right? You have the ability at this point to transmit information almost instantaneously through the telegraph, but how do you then broadcast that information? And in a pre-radio, pre-television, pre-internet era, light was their solution. That's really cool because I, uh, you know, it's like uh, broadcast, uh, radio, broadcast radio is very famously an intimate medium. It's a one-to-one, right? Because we're always talking to one person. But TV is such a spectacle. It's like you're, you're apprehending the scene with so many other people. So this feels almost like early TV to me. Big light in the sky. It's like a spectacle. Yeah, it's a really communal thing. And, and Jody, I, I hope it's okay to head back in time a little bit at this point. But this was something that the Times had been experimenting with in order to be both fast and accurate. So one of the other things that they did um, in order to communicate results was to put a big canvas on the side of the New York Times building and project the results on that big canvas so that huge groups of people who are gathered to see who won individual races could see those races projected on the side of the New York Times building. Was it, was it just a name like Taft or whoever it is? Or, or was it like uh, John King with the with the districts, <laughs> like moving them around with his finger? Was it, was it detailed results or like just a name? No, not detailed. Just a name, but also like pictures and things like that, because they were turning it into, as you were saying, a spectacle. They wanted it to be entertaining. So you had the pictures of the different candidates, you had the results, and then you had things like cartoons just interspersed to keep people entertained while they were ra- waiting for results. Wow. So this is, ni- you say this is 1904? So 1904 was when they did the news flash, when they did these projections was actually back in the 1870s. Wow. So this is like 15 years before radio at this point. Yeah. So we're like pre-radio. We are like in the in the days of ham radio and Morse code and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Um, and so communicating these kinds of results... You know, you're do- if you're doing it locally, this is a great way to get the information to a large number of, of people locally um, and also claiming something for The New York Times. Right. So we read some of these um, write ups of it. And The New York Times was very pleased with itself in yes. the 1870s for this innovation. <laughs> Uh, networks and the New York Times in particular being pleased with itself for these innovations will be a th- theme throughout uh, this episode, I think. Um, but I guess this brings up one big question, which I may as well ask now. But, you know, this notion of, um, you know, wanting to gather uh, and this continues to happen. Right. In 2008, 50,000 people just went into Times Square to then watch TV. Right. It's something you can do in your in your house by 2008 by yourself. For some reason, people have this instinct to gather and do it together and watch election results. But then also this notion of election results being a thing that happens over time as opposed to just a fact that gets delivered when it's decided. And, Jad, I, you know, this, I think, gets at some of the like fundamental questions about all of this, which is some people just say, like, wait for the results. And when we know, we know, and that's the point of it. And other people are much more interested in the kind of like experience of gathering the results. And I'm curious where you, where you, well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's funny, you know, where my, my mind goes is we just tried to vote. And as I was walking to the, to the uh, polling place, I was asking my wife, I was like, why are, why do we vote in New York? It's kind of pointless. Like our votes don't count here. We don't, we don't live in Ohio. And her answer to me was telling, she was like, I just want to I just want to to be a part of the experience, the collective experience. So mm-hmm. I actually kind of want to stand in line. I want I want to see all the people because uh, it's it's one of only two times that we actually physically connect with our democracy. It's that and and jury duty. I think those are the only real times. The rest of the time we just complain about it. So it feels like the experiential, communal, spectacle nature of it is, I think, the point in some way. Um, but to your question, uh, Jody, I. Uh, it's interesting. You know what I think about, which this is sort of a random thought that isn't quite answering your question, but everybody tells us, we just ran a, uh, a radio lab episode about this. Everyone tells us that election night, we should now think of it as like an election quarter or an election, <laughs> you know, Season three months. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, we're going to have the night, obviously, but then, you know, we, now we have so many mail-in votes and times are going to shift backwards and then who knows how many court battles are going to take us maybe into December. Who, uh, it is interesting to me that, in a sense, we are going f- back in time or some way. We're unwinding history in some real way. Uh, in that it, the New York Times in 1904, as you were saying, uh, 
wanted to be first, so they wanted to speed it up. They wanted to collapse time. And now I think time is uncollapsing on us mm. in some way, uh, which I find interesting in a way. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know. There is some, there is some happy medium between instantaneous results and I think a delay that is important and that is necessary to count the votes and to just like steady the pulse yeah. in some way. And I think a lot of this has to do with expectations, right? Because you are you are moving us on to a more, dare I say, originalist timeline when it comes to federal elections, which is, you know, when, when George Washington was elected president, it took a few months to figure out like, oh, you know, yeah. count all the results, get the electors together, send a letter to George Washington and say, hey, you're president. It's why presidents weren't inaugurated until March, because you had to mm. count the votes, get the results, get it communicated, get everybody to Washington, D.C. Um, when they moved the Capitol there. So there is this kind of sense that we're moving backwards in that way. But what hasn't yeah. caught up with that is expectations, because that's what's being set in 1904. And as we'll talk about, like in the television era, is that expectation that the event isn't election day, which in the 19th century was when everybody was celebrating and commuting and all that, but election night night that you're gathering for the results rather than just celebrating democracy in, in the abstract. When was the expectation set that it would be a night and not a vast expanse of time? That is a great question. And I think that really formally, it's when television and computers get involved. Um, in 1952, you have the introduction of these um, computers that are projecting the results. Um, and you have news desks that are um, relying on those computers. So in 1952, um, you have competing computers. They don't actually trust them right away. CBS uses a Univac computer and the confidence level is so high, like it spits out an early result that Eisenhower is going to win with 99% confidence. They're like, there is no way this is right. Yeah. And it ended up being right. Um, and I wow. think that's when you get that expectation. Yeah, that's one of my favorite moments in all of this. This 1952, which is our next stop on our on our tour here, CBS and ABC and, and NBC, you know, they do come out to your point, Chad, and say, like, for the first time ever, we're going to project and we're going to give you cutting edge information and we're going to be able to basically paint this picture in real time. Um, so that I think, Nikki, you're right, that that is when it really starts to all come together, this, this expectation of speed. Um Univac is this computer that CBS is relying on, and it it spits out a number. Um, it says Eisenhower is going to win, and they don't trust it. And in real time, they basically decide to to squash it and not listen to the computer. And of course, the computer ended up being right. So, I mean, I think there's also a lesson there about like the speed of technology versus the speed of the human brain, and there there's yeah. going to be this moment of disconnect. I was going to say, um, it was a blowout election, right? In 1948, right. it was a whisper-thin election. The election between Dewey and Truman for president was incredibly close, razor-thin, and newspapers who are getting early results are like, oh, it, it looks like Dewey won. And so I think it's, it's the Chicago Tribune that had as its headline Dewey defeats Truman because they went to press before the final results were certified. And of course, it goes down in history as this moment of real embarrassment for the paper because they got it wrong. It's one thing to be first, but you got to be first and right. And that's part of the reason why they want these new computers to be part of the process so that they get it right. Um, but in 1952 and in 1956, they're just... Eisenhower wins by an absolute landslide. So, of course, the computer's confident because it's like everybody's voting for Eisenhower. And no. do you know if the newsmen were embarrassed by the Univac, too? So that's a good question. I don't know if they were embarrassed by it. I think they were just uncertain about its role. In fact, in 1956, they actually have this competition on ABC where they pit a human pollster, Lou Harris, against the, the computer to see like who can call it first and who can call it most accurately. Um, and I think that indicates there's still some like tension around, are we really going to outsource all of this to a computer instead of our it's human It's like brain? when John Henry raced that uh, steam engine. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, the poster died at the end of that one too, actually. It was very tragic. Uh, but actually, uh, Nikki, you know, I think Eisenhower is really interesting here too, because we've talked about him on the show as like someone who I think bridges this gap between a type of politics that is informed by data and polling. And he's very skeptical, right? Uh, the first time he runs for president of all this, and then he kind of comes around. And I think he represents this 
you know, an evolution in that way to embrace embrace these tactics. Yeah, it's a really interesting tension in this era where people are entranced with futurism and the kinds of things that computers can do, but they're also a little wary of them. And to have a president sort of make that make that transition along with the people is is an interesting one. You, and you hear people even then, you know, raising the alarm of like, wait a minute, we shouldn't treat people as just data points. We shouldn't mm-hmm. slice and dice the electorate. You know, your demographics aren't determinative of who you are. I mean, people were really asking those sort of deep questions way back when, and they obviously continue to, to today. Indeed. Did you have exit polls back then? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, we we must have had some in order to make those kinds of projections. Um, but I think that elect that um, exit polls become more popular in the 1970s and 1980s. I know that exit polls start to cause problems is maybe not the right word, but right. there's a there's a more of a reliance on exit polls by the time you get to the 1980 election, which, um, as we'll talk about, causes some issues. Yeah, I think the UNIVAC and some of these other computers were mostly just sort of demographic data merged um, with political projection. Um, and then as results come in, you, you go from there. And then now, obviously, there's other tools. So we can keep keep going through our tour here. Um, by the time we get to 1980, um, there's this other interesting thing that happens, which is uh, this other feature of election night coverage, which is calling an election. So we have these tools, as we've been saying, to project winners. Now we have exit polling. They're getting pretty good and they're ingrained through the 60s and 70s. And then by the 80s, you get to this point, this interesting moment where in theory, you can declare a winner pretty early on, even before an election is decided. And the way it specifically manifests itself is uh, this question of should a news organization on the East Coast call a winner before polls have even closed on the West Coast? Wow. And yeah, this actually happens in 1980, which again, 80 and 84 other landslide elections. So it's pretty easy to tell early on that Reagan has won in 1980. And so the decision desk calls it at 815 Eastern. Meanwhile, people in California are still casting their votes. um, And there is a real backlash against this, Um, this idea that if the election's called, then people don't have a reason to stand in line, which hurts down ballot races. But also, it feels kind of like you've been cheated, like the East Coast decided who won this election before you could even vote. Yeah, I would think if you're standing in line in California and word gets to you that it's already been called... I feel simultaneously annoyed and I'm leaving. I'm getting out of line. <laughs> exactly. Going to go get tacos. Right. right. Which is sort of, I think, a little bit of the feeling you were describing earlier of just my vote doesn't doesn't matter. You know, mm-hmm. other people have decided this thing for me. And I think so that's sort of reflected throughout a lot of our election systems. Uh, you hear this critique, too, though, even with and we'll get to this stuff, but even with the stuff that 538 does, for instance, you know. It's the Heisenberg principle question of electoral co- coverage is, you know, are you influencing the election by naming the state of the race? Um, I will say, like, I was inside at 538. Like, I never really figured out how to grapple with that. I mean, it's a mm. really tough question. I think it's a very valid question. Um, this particular, like, time zone thing is, a, is the simplest version of it. You can just say, no, we won't project a winner until all the polls are closed. But it gets at this much bigger, more complicated thing, which is, like, when you cover a race, are you also then as the electorate gets savvier and savvier right. and more strategic, um, are you then also influencing the race itself too? Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me a little bit of the um, the wisdom of crowds. This is going to track us off, but the, the, the sort of <laughs> one of the principles of the wisdom of crowds, like one of the first times where the wisdom of crowds was ascertained was uh, one of those jelly bean guessing things that happens at a fair. How many jelly beans are in this giant jar? And if you ask each person to guess independently and then take all the guesses and average them, you will get a really accurate number. But it's it's incumbent that each person have an absolutely independent guess. They can't be talking to each other. And I think right. it's the crosstalk that screws up the uh, one of the keys to group wisdom, which is everybody has to make their own decision without being tampered with, and then you pull that together. But then if you get all these early polls, it screws up the first part. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because it actually makes me think of the fact that until the late 19th century, the ballot wasn't private. You didn't have people individually going off even on Election Day to cast their ballots based on their private internal reflections. It was a public act that everyone could see and, of course, I think would have the same effect, which is to influence the vote. And so the polls are sort of like your... 
I don't know, your early indicator as to where people might be leaning. Yeah. I mean, you know, the counter argument, which I also think I buy, is just that a more informed electorate is a more informed electorate. And that like people being strategic, you know, voting is something you should take very seriously and being strategic is a sign of that. Um, And I think, you know, you're weirdly seeing it. It's sort of perverse, but you're kind of seeing that playing out in now when people do that whole like ignore the polls, just go vote or the polls could be wrong. Just go in a weird way. That's a sign that it's working and that it's at least like focusing people's attention. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's like motivating them. But, you know, whatever it takes to get you motivated and engaged, I suppose. Anything else on, uh, on on calling elections or do you want to go to other than other than to point out that it's also just messed up that um Different states have different times that they close the polls and even different states are split between states. So parts of Florida close at certain times and other parts of Florida and time zones in general are stupid, in my opinion. Uh, You know, get it all out. uh, Yeah. So (laughs) it's just all vote. Uh, No, No, I mean, it's like I find elections like it's a fascinating study in the baffling differences between states. Yeah. Like primaries versus caucuses versus winner take all versus proportional i'm like wait what it's every state like why do you why does nevada have to be different than south dakota why can't everybody get on the same page here it's very confusing why does a tiny tiny village in new hampshire cast all of its ballots and count them at midnight on election day i mean it's we have so many of these like local oddities yeah so let's go to 2000 um another sort of big moment and i think maybe one that not that long ago, but people have sort of forgotten, which is 2000 really, Nikki, is the year in which our notion of states being red and blue and the sort of color coding of states, uh, red for Republican and blue for a Democrat, gets solidified. It really wasn't the case prior to just not that long ago. I know we should warn listeners that we're now entering the election night trauma portion of this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you, you know, there had been a lot of... Um, uh, going back and forth, right? First of all, this isn't an issue until you have color television. Um, so it's really like the 1970s and 1980s that this starts to become an issue. And there are all kinds of colors being used. Red and blue are obviously like these strong patriotic colors, but yellow is being used. They're not assigned to a particular party. But by the time you get to the 2000 election, um, they sort of coalesce on red for Republican and blue for Democrat. And it becomes especially important as the election results drag out over more than a month because there's this way of talking about, like, is Florida going to be a red state or a blue state? Um, In an evenly divided country, you have red states against blue states. And maybe Al Gore will be the president of the blue states and Bush will be the president of the red states. And that language starts to get ingrained in the way journalists talk about politics and pundits talk about politics. It, it, that was just 2000 when that came on board. That feels like a law of physics at this point. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of it's kind of amazing how quickly it does. But just to, just to paint a little picture, I mean, even in so what in '76, Ford was was put up on screen as yellow, um, and Carter was blue. But then before that, it was actually reversed, right? And and the Liberal Party, because the Liberal Party in the UK has generally been associated with red. And so in the '70s and and into the '80s, when television networks were trying to decide how to do this, they sort of defaulted to that and said, "Okay, we'll make Democrats red." So it's actually not just like wow. not codified, but it was sort of the opposite for a while. And I don't know, Nikki, do you know why? Or maybe this was what you were about to say. Do you know why they chose ended up choosing? red for Republicans? You know, people um, say that it's because of the alliteration, red and Republican. Um, and and they just sure. stopped at one. They were like, one, one alliteration <laughs> exactly. is good enough. <laughs> That'll do it first. Democrat and dark blue, I guess, is how they would yeah. do it. But um, right, right. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of story. And, and to your question, Jed, I mean, I think that it was starting to trend in that direction. Like everyone wasn't on the same page, but more and more news outlets over the course of the 1990s in particular were starting to move towards this Republican red, Democrat blue. But like it really just snaps into place in 2000. So much so that when Barack Obama gives his speech in 2004, he can talk about, you know, there's not a red America and a blue America and have it be completely legible to everyone. Like it's just part of the political lexicon at that point. That's funny because as an 80s kid, I remember uh, Reagan, he referred to like a red wave as, a, as communism. I remember red meant communism. It's interesting that to think that that has shifted so much. 
Yeah, this is exactly right. I mean, it's why Republicans didn't want to be red, because it was so closely associated with the communist threat that they saw themselves as the party that was most aligned against. So they they didn't want to be red. Wow. Um, I mean, Obama, I think, you know, had this great line. um, And he says, you know, this is dividing us and splitting states into different colors. You know, look, symbolism matters, I think. um, But what do you think? I mean, does this actually sort of serve to divide us because it's such a strong visual representation of of this country? I mean, I I don't know. I I think certainly it is one of the ways which we sort of like, we sort of sort and clump people into tribes. Um, But I I do remember the 2000 election in particular. I believe it was the 2000 election. And I I do remember this was the beginning of like a data viz kind of like really becoming an art. And somebody in one of the publications had had done a red blue state breakdown where it wasn't by state but it was by uh, counties and, and and what you saw was a very different demographic where it was just a kind of a a starry night of blue and red splotches and there was no defined states that were red or blue it was a kind of smear and in that I remember it being I remember being struck that oh we are actually much more I don't know if unified is the right language but we are much more commingled than it mm-hmm. might seem you know I think that's such an important point because I, I do think, Jody, that it has a kind of polarizing effect, which is to say it has a totalizing effect that, you know, Michigan is either a blue state or it's a red state. And that tells you everything that you need to know about that state. Is it liberal or is it conservative? We essentialize it, right? Um, we start to think of those states and everybody in those states as thinking and acting in one way. And that's why that county level data is so interesting, because it does sort of allow for more commingling. Yeah. 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 The irony, of course, is that we are now sorting ourselves more and more as the years have gone on. And, you know, um, and so actually that map that you referred to, Chad, would probably be pretty like solid red and solid blue, um, but not as much as, you know, big colored in states for sure well and this could i mean Uh, the heisenberg principle could come into play here too right if we keep calling um well this might change but if we keep calling texas a red state and then people who are conservatives who are participating in this big sort where we all sort of want to live around people who think and vote like us um then they might all move to texas um solidifying kind of its identity as a red state obviously i picked a bad example because that is more of a, a purple state these days um All right. You want to move to 2016? Uh, And this is kind of where we'll wrap up and then we'll talk about this coming election. Um, But for 2016, I thought we could talk a little bit about the the needle. So the needle was the tool that the New York Times came up with to use on election night in 2016. They've used it a few times since then. And it was a way to basically show the state of the race at a given moment as partial results would come in. It would extrapolate where results hadn't come in and, and then use that information to make a projection and the needle would sort of bounce back and forth. And I think especially for people who were maybe hoping for Hillary Clinton to win or maybe were surprised by the results, I think the needle served as a particular source of trauma because it was one of the things that a lot of people were watching and it really did swing from showing Hillary Clinton in the lead, which was the final projection um, to then showing Donald Trump as the eventual winner. So Nikki, I'm curious, you know, on that night, were you watching the needle i think you were also doing some tv work as well yeah um i was doing television spots and i was running back and forth from the studio to my hotel so most of the the input i was getting about the election was on my phone as i was walking back and forth between these two locations and so i was tuning into the needle and it would move quite a lot between those spots yeah, um yeah. and so it would be in a way it was kind of more shocking because I didn't see the gradual float over to the Donald Trump side. I would just like get off air, look at it, and suddenly it was like, oh. Oh, it was doing kind of a Richter sort of back and forth? <laughs> yeah, or, or that it was um, mo- moving quite rapidly toward Trump. And so the the needle was the communication for me. And the needle had Hillary Clinton at 80% at the beginning of the night, 730, and it eventually moved 95% to Trump. Um, and it and it did do its job in that it really, you know, for instance, it had Donald Trump winning Pennsylvania while Hillary Clinton still led in the vote count, which is the goal of these projections is to sort of identify what's coming in and, and extrapolate from there. And, I, you know, I was doing live coverage 
uh, with 538 that night and sort of hosting little web video stuff. And um, we weren't watching the needle, but we were getting similar information that was giving yeah. us these tea leaves that we could then extrapolate. Um, you know, to me, I think, well, first off, people, I learned this the hard way in 2016, you know, people will hear what they want to hear and project whatever anxieties they have onto the information that's given to them <laughs> at any given point. And I think that's both just the, the way it is, and all, but also something I think people need to consider when you are a conveyor of information. So that's yeah. one thing. Yeah. But the other is that I do think that the needle, you know, um, as I said, kind of did its job and that if people were watching it in good faith, they probably would have given them a picture of what was happening as early, you know, earlier than almost anyone else. But the complications a little bit came down to actually like some of the sort of very specific presentations of it. And so 2016 was bad, but then when the needle was also used in 2018 and 2020, it was very like jittery. And I think just like for a lot of people, the yeah. fact that it was just like this thing that they were watching that was bouncing back and forth um, sort of reflected a lot of the other anxieties and yeah. you know i know it sounds minor but like at 538 we would grapple with we grappled with this a little bit in terms of like when you are offering a projection do you say 58.62 percent or do you just say 58 percent, or do you say slightly more than half like there's all of these little choices that you have to make in terms of how you present data and how you tell that story and i think the needle is a good example of like maybe it was just its jitteriness that kind of didn't sit well with people in addition to it being a place where they could project all of these other insecurities and hangups. I, it feels like an unhelpful drug. You know, oh yeah, like the needle. Well, like, most needles, most needles provide <laughs> this. Well, maybe that's what's sort of driving my mind in that direction. But um, you know, I mean, it's it, uh, it it does have the effect of keeping you glued to it. Um, mm -hmm. And there is that dead space b between when votes, when you cast your vote, and when you know the outcome. And yeah, it fills the space, I guess. But then I, you know, I transpose the needle to, we see it a lot in sports, right? So the, you have this kind of like very jittery needle throughout a football game, for example, and it says the Saints have a 44.9% 4 chance of winning. Oh, it's now up to 60%. Oh, it's now up to 63%. It, it, and and it, that there's something addictive about that, but then it seems to just be responding to the score. You know, the Saints were down and then they were tied and then they were up so it's almost this kind of strange frenetic transposition of very ordinary information that we could just take and be okay with but somehow there's like a derivative industry of hyperkinetic information that's formed around a very simple act and it just kind of like turns up the volume in a way that isn't helpful yeah, Patrick Hubra wrote this piece, I think back in 2012, called The Sports Centerization of Politics. And it's basically the same idea that, that you know, the way that we cover and talk about politics, and especially elections, um, is in this very entertainment-based mode. Because these are media companies who need mm -hmm. you to watch and want you to tune in and want you to use them as, as your source of information. And... I think that similarity between how we think about sports coverage and how we think about elections. I mean, it's no surprise that somebody like Nate Silver came from the world of sports to yeah. the world of politics. Yeah. And it, it, it strikes me a little bit like 2008 when you had um, credit default swaps trading on bad loans, which were trading on something else, which were trading on something else. You had five layers of activity around the central act of owning a home. And you had somebody betting on somebody else's bet on somebody else's bet. And you, it, it feel, politics feels a little bit like that in the way that we measure it. If we could just get back to the central act, which is you walk into a voting booth and you make a choice. And then if there could be behind the voting booth an anechoic chamber that we all have to go into <laughs> and just be quiet for about a day and reflect on our own, you know, what we just did. I think we'd be better, you know, as opposed to all of this noise. I don't know. I sound like a curmudgeon suddenly. Well, look, I mean, here's here's my sort of defense and sort of sort of my thinking of of how this universe of information that you just described can be actually useful. And I and this is sort of what I came to realize in my time at five thirty eight and just engaging with this stuff. But you know, I think it, it in the way that we just described, especially because of the sports sort of roots of it, all of this stuff feels like final information it feels like the end of a sentence right like this is the state of the race this is a prediction this is who's going to win this is finality 
And in fact, you know, I think the way to think of it is, is the beginning of a sentence, right? And there's this incredibly seductive side to it where it just feels like concrete and, and information based and you could just land on it and plant your feet. But actually, it should be a place to to prompt conversations about what we don't know um, and what information is still out there and what the narratives are versus what the information is. Like, it should just prompt us to do this thinking. And that was my sort of big thing with 538 is I came to kind of understand it as at its best, it's a site about uncertainty. It's not a site about telling you where things stand. It's a site that is there to explore what we don't know as much as what we do. Because, you know, it's funny. It's like, I, I kind of want to argue with the thing you said a moment ago, which is, but I'm not sure I, I don't, I'm not sure I have a legitimate argument, <laughs> uh, but I'll start speaking. Never stop someone from going on TV on election <laughs> <That's right>. night. <laughs> no, but I, I do, I, and Nicole, I think about what, something you said earlier, which is the, there's something about the red state, blue state narrative, which has a totalizing effect. It, it somehow predisposes people to see in that way uh, and distort themselves in that way. And I do think there's something about all of the predictive language that gets wrapped around yeah. uh, politics. It's somehow... It has a corrupting influence on on, uh, uh, on what I think has to be a fundamentally personal act. You have to sort of look at your own life, look at your family's life, look at your own values, and then make a decision. Uh, but there's all of this conversation that forces you to take into into your consciousness the totality of the people around you, where things might go, and it all just has the effect of distracting for what I think has to be a, a personal introspective act. And a civic act, obviously, but it has to begin with the individual, in, in my opinion. So there's something about beginning the sentence that way every time, as you say, that is forcing the end of the sentence to be not what it should be. <laughs> well, and I think the other complicating factor here is the the reader who is searching out this information wants the end of the sentence and not the beginning. They're coming to look at predictions and projections because they right. want a sense of certainty about something that feels both very momentous um, in that personal and civic way um, and uncertain. Like if you can just crack the code so that you can know a month in advance exactly what's going to happen, then you don't have to like fret and get ulcers during the month of October. Um, and so navigating all of those different expectations, which is Jody you were saying have been set over the course of a century is quite the challenge. It's interesting to me that a lot of the sort of um, the partisan dueling narratives around, say, uh, election night results versus mail-in results it is, a, is really a conversation about time and trying to kind of calibrate people's expectations for uh, when we'll know something that we can trust. And uh, it's hard to assess how much the narrative is getting out there and how sticky it is. But I have definitely seen people get comfortable with the idea that it's going to be a while and we're going to need a minute to sort of process yeah. and, and kind yeah, of take stock right. of things. Yeah, I mean, as as with a lot of other parts of our democracy, I think people are, act, are asking some of these sort of fundamental questions in a way that can it's both a sign of how broken things are, but also a sign of, you know, maybe people are starting to to grapple and maybe that's some of the lasting change here. Um, but at the very least, right, I think what we can do Jad, if you're willing, is if you can take a flashlight <laughs> and climb to the top of Fort Green Tower, uh, it doesn't have to be on election night itself, but maybe in the days or weeks. And if you flash north and you do a little like signal going north, <laughs> that will indicate something. And if you go south, that'll, and then maybe, you know, maybe that'll be a nice, slow, communal way to convey this information. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I, I, I love that idea. I love that it's sort of, but it has to be completely opaque so no one can understand what. It's maybe to like flash oh, yeah. like w winging around in a circle. People won't know what that means. I love that. I love, let's go back to the telegraph, I think. Uh, and horses. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. We're going to leave it there. Uh, Jad, I'm going to thank you uh, yeah. so much for doing this. Thanks it's for having fun. me. And Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody.